The following is a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Well, even this morning as I was thinking about what to pray and all that could be prayed for as we have the time to petition the Lord, confident in our request to be heard, there is seemingly so much to, to pray about. There's so much to learn. There's so much that's happening and all that that means. And I think about even just in the idea of news, so much that is happening in the world today. I mean, you just consider the fact that in our own country alone, there are 1,387 daily newspapers who are attempting to record all the news that's taking place far and beyond, up close and personal and in other parts and other communities. I mean, even just this morning, think about on one end of the country, the Seattle Times is reporting about a restaurant in Bellevue, Washington that's accused of tax cheating. On the other end of the country, you have the, the Bangor Daily News in Maine reporting today about that home ownership is getting out of reach for most people in Knox County, the concern of that. But then you have the rest of the world, not just our own country. You have the, the Indian Express is reporting today that the prime minister is condemning project delays in India saying that a new work culture is needed there in that country and how to bring that about and the implications of that that must take place. So the question is, if there is so much happening, how do you and I keep up with the major headlines and know what is happening in the world in a variety of areas? Well, for me, as I try to stay abreast of all that's happening and read of the things happening in the news, I, I choose a news feeder, one that will kind of distill for me the major headlines and the major sources and the major news providers. For me, that is found in the Google news feeder. I can read the top six stories of what's happening in the world of any given news source and then learn some of the significant news updates in categories like business, technology, or sports. So for just for example, just this morning, from Reuters, it says that North Korea has put a satellite into space. There's concern about this project because of the implications of their nuclear capacity and their desire to wage war on their immediate neighbors, let alone us, from a distance. According to Bloomberg, though, the Taiwan earthquake toll climbs to 26 and continually is escalating as the body count is rising in its reporting. Meanwhile, the New York Times is reporting that in the Republican debate that took place last night, rivals were jabbing at Marco Rubio to try to slow his rise in New Hampshire with the upcoming reports there. When you think about the challenge of reporting the news and knowing what to cover in a short amount of time, is similar to thinking about what would you say if you're expected to talk about the Bible? If you were asked to cover the Bible and explain it to somebody, what would you say? There are seemingly so many different informational facts and seemingly news updates you can give, things that people did not know that if you share with them, they'll come to understand. So much to report. What would you cover if given that opportunity? I mean, the Bible teaches that farmers were required to leave parts of their field unharvested for strangers. It talks about this in the Old Testament. Should we speak of that? Explain that is, after all, an inspired Word of God. We also realize that the Jordan River was parted by Elijah with his coat in 2 Kings chapter 2. We need to speak about this at some time. It is, after all, in God's Word. Jesus and Peter once paid taxes with a coin found in a fish's mouth in Matthew 17. This seemingly is head-scratching and attention-grabbing. It seems like it's worth a conversation or two with some friends. Did you know? The question, though, comes when it comes to reporting on the news of the Scripture. What shall we say? So much has happened. All of it is important. Otherwise, it would not be inspired and preserved for us in the Word of God. It is all a part of the tapestry of God's revelation. But the question is, what shall we say when given the opportunity if someone does not know much about the Scripture? How shall we prioritize? What shall be, if you will, our news feeder to distill the essentials? For those of you who have not been with us these last couple of weeks, we have started working through a series on the gospel and the significance of that gospel as to our responsibility to communicate it to others. 
in our series on evangelism, two weeks ago, we learned why Jesus came. We learned He came to seek and to save the lost. We saw that in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Last week, we learned that what we are called to do. We are called to make disciples. It's been coined the Great Commission. It's not exceptional to the early disciples, the, the eyewitness accounts of Jesus and those early first-generation apostles, but it's normative and expressed and expected of all the generations to follow to as well be making disciples. Well, this week we're going to learn what we are called to say in that news feeder of scriptural communication, of Bible explanation, what we are called to say starting with is the gospel, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Our title for today is Announcing the Headlines, Telling the News Everyone Needs to Hear. Telling the News Everyone Needs to Hear. Now, from the very beginning as we represent this understanding of the gospel, it's important that we understand just the very vocabulary we are using. Lest we assume too much upon any, any one of you today that you might not actually recognize what it is that I'm referring to or that's being referenced in the Scripture, even being represented in spoken representation. The word gospel originates from the meaning of the New Testament and the Greek word evangelion. It comes from and eventually means good news. That's what this word means, good news. It was originally transmitted into Old English as God's spell, eventually becoming gospel. The gospel is epitomized by Jesus Christ when He says in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, He says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Well, the question is, what is the gospel? What does it mean to believe in the gospel? How do we communicate that? Well, as you can see on the screen there, let me just give you kind of an orientation definition of the gospel so that you might understand it. The gospel is the good news that God has entered the world in Jesus Christ to achieve a salvation that we could not achieve for ourselves, which now converts and transforms individuals, forming them into a new humanity and eventually will renew the whole world and all creation. All people are called on to respond by repenting of their sin and putting their trust in Jesus Christ alone for their forgiveness. This is the gospel. And make no mistake about it, friends, for those of you who have never actually understood that or have never actually believed in that and therefore responded by repentance and faith, then friends, let me tell you, that is the most essential message you could ever hear me or any other Christian say to you. Even now as I speak to you, I would call upon you to reflect on that truth, to recognize the reality of not only the fallen, broken world, but also illustrated and demonstrated by the very life you live but the hope that God gives to restore mankind and to restore you and to make us into new humanity and only through those who put their faith alone in Christ alone. Well, our text to understand this as we unpack it this morning is in Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 is our text this morning as we begin to just try to identify what is found throughout the pages of the Scriptures, Old and New Testament, the whole canon the whole counsel of God. For our purposes this morning, I've chosen Galatians chapter 3. Now, as we look at Galatians chapter 3, let me just first of all set the scene for us. It needs to be understood what's happening here in the book of Galatians. Galatians is basically a church of Christians, a gathered group of Christians who are gathered in the city of Galatia. So you think of Indianapolis, think of Galatia. You think of a smaller subset of Indianapolis, you think of Castleton area. You have a gathered group of Christians. Well, what's happened with this group of Christians in Galatia is that they have fallen victim to, if you will, they have listened to the whisperings and the teachings and the writings of people who have actually taught something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is just a primary and a fundamental issue. In fact, Paul starts off very strong after his introduction. He says in chapter 1 of Galatians, verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. 
And Paul goes on to explain verse 7, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. That's the issue I want to address today. I want to address the issue of gospel distortion. Gospel distortion happens, first of all, just as a preliminary point of introduction, if you don't even understand the gospel to begin with. You cannot distort what you do not know. But then the distortion comes when you begin to replace it and or add to it in such a way that dilutes its message and takes away from it essentially from what it originally taught. That's exactly what happens here. He says in verse 11 of chapter 1, just going to continue to illustrate the theme, the challenge, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor as I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to explain that. And so what ends up happening here later on chapter 2 and chapter 3 is he's trying to take away that distortion. He's trying to provide clarity and purity of that message. Now, to every Christian present here today, this is equally important for you as well. Not only in your understanding for your own reflection and thankfulness of the work of Jesus Christ, but also for your communication of it. For sadly and tragically, many Christians, though well-meaning in their intention, have knowingly, I actually trust, I hope, unknowingly distorted the gospel in their communication of it when they've attempted to talk about the Bible. So we're kind of back to the idea of the news feeder. How do we explain that? Well, Galatians chapter 3. Let's just set the stage and start in verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then, then, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now we get to our text, verses 10 to 13. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Curse be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. All right, now just using verses 10 to 13, let me, if I can, outline for you the gospel message. So think of the, the news feeder of the scriptures. You as a Christian are committed now and convinced now propositionally and intend to act personally in making disciples. How do you do so by proclaiming the gospel? What is the gospel? Here we go. First of all, number one, mankind's goal is to be made right with God. Mankind's goal is to be made right with God. One of the things I appreciated earlier about the definition we put up on the screen, which we don't need to look at again, but is the reality that it speaks of the comprehensiveness of the fallenness of society and how personal it is to you and to me. The problem that we have is that we are born into sin. And the reason that this is a problem is because it is contrary to the very nature of God who created us, who's the very explanation behind why we exist. We exist because God created us. The problem is not God, the problem is us. The contrast from God's holiness and righteousness, 
who in his triune perfection as God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, in perfect fellowship out of the divine wisdom and power of his ability created us, but we, because of the fall of man in Genesis 3, have sinned against him. And now, birth after birth, generation after generation, we continually keep this generational reputation going of sin. And our problem is sin. And the fact that we are not naturally dispositionally, willfully, emotionally, or any other expression of our humanity right with God. We are broken. We are severed in relationship. And we, we, we hear the tones of this, if you will, back in verse 11. It says, no one is justified before God. Now, why do we care about being justified? Because without justification, there is only condemnation. See, friends, God in His holiness, as an expression and commitment to the holiness, must continually demonstrate that commitment by dealing with anything contrary to that. He cannot be in fellowship with it. He cannot legitimize any other representation of it. It would, it would impugn His character. So the desire of all of mankind, the desire of every person, whether you realize it or not, should be to be made right with God. In the words of Scripture, to be justified, to be declared right. Think of this in a, in a legal courtroom sense. The opportunity to be found, to be tried and to be found guilty of sins, of criminal actions. Well, it does not appear to be just if you know that the person accused is indeed guilty of heinous, compounding, treacherous acts of criminal activity, that then the judge says, you know what, I want to be nice and let you free. What would you cry? You would cry injustice. You would demand that judge be replaced. It would be an abuse of his position as a judge. No less can God himself turn an eye from and declare right a sinner because simply of his own desire to pass over that and not judge that as if somehow he is apologizing for his holiness and his commitment to justice. The first communication, the first point we want to make clear when we talk to people is that the goal is to be made right with God. But then the second aspect here we see back in verse 10 is that everyone who relies on their works, on their good deeds, will be cursed. So the problem is being justified before God, verse 11. But the problem is even compounded by our futile efforts. Look at verse 10. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Now it introduces this term for our purposes this morning that's been referenced earlier in his writings and it keeps up coming up kind of in compounding fashion here, this idea of the law, the works of the law, the book of the law, before God by the law. It continually references the law. The law is the demonstration of God in written form of His character and attributes. It's, a, it's, it's how God intends His creation to live in response to His personhood. And it has been represented in a number of ways. The law of God, generally speaking, anything that He puts forth, that He commands, that He decrees, it's been given in particular representations. For example, the Mosaic law, the law of Christ, what we have here in this context are the commands of God and the idea to say anybody who relies on the works of the law are under a curse. This is kind of Bible speech for saying anybody who is depending upon their good works, their good actions, based upon the definition of good, you're in trouble, friend. You're in trouble. And when you're in conversation with other people about this, this isn't something you're saying is unique to them. You're saying is actually common to both of you. In fact, it's common to all mankind. All mankind. Everyone who relies on their works will be cursed. Everybody. This isn't, we're not discriminating against anybody. We're saying this is an equal representation of how bad, how pervasive sin is. Now, they might not refer to it as sin, but that's indeed what it is. And it, notice the language here. You are under a curse. What's the curse? Cursed be everyone who does not abide by, look at what it says, all things 
written in the book of the law and do them. See, that's the problem. The problem is how comprehensive God is committed to his word as an expression of his commitment to himself. God is committed to the holiness of all of his, all of his word, all of his law, and the obedience to it as the means by which you can be right with God. Ever lied? Ever been lazy? Ever been selfish? Ever stolen anything? Ever lusted? Ever been angry? Ever been bitter? You ever not been forgiving? I have. All those and more. The Bible is saying here, one, one offense condemns you. Let alone the thousands upon thousands that you have personally, knowingly, and unknowingly committed against the Word of God. Everyone who relies on their works will be cursed. But that takes us to the third point here. of what's said in the text, clearly in verse 13, Jesus Christ becomes cursed through his death on the cross. Notice the, the exchange that takes place. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. You see, one time, sometimes it happens in Christian communication about the gospel is there can almost be like this apology for God's commitment to justice. Like, man, I got bad news. Hell is real. Sinners go there who do not repent of their sins. God is merciful and gracious, and I'd love to talk to you about his love, but there is this like asterisk on the character of God. I feel like I need to apologize for, but it's in there. But let's not dwell on that long. Let's get back to that smiling conversation. <laughs> Eternal life, dude. Golden streets. You want some of that? Friends, why would you apologize for an attribute of God that God doesn't apologize for himself? And even the Son of God will become a willing sacrifice to satisfy that attribute of justice and therefore corresponding wrath. See, what's, what's unfortunate is when Christians become almost squeamish and embarrassing about the fullness of the gospel and what it means to be condemned, what it means to be cursed, what it means to be judged, almost as if you could communicate the gospel and skip over that part. Friends, when you do that, you're, you're distorting the gospel. You see, the gospel by sort of shorthand definition of good news is the good news only as understood in contrast to the bad news, which is either not understood or understood but wanting to be denied. God does not deny it. You notice how he speaks of this issue of the curse. Everyone who does not abide by all these things, well, what? They'll be cursed. But there becomes this transition, a substitute. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us. Substitutionary atonement. Atonement, meaning payment. Jesus Christ accomplished perfection of all the law. Every work of the law ever asked, ever demanded, ever required, every actual display of it in thought, word, and action, Jesus accomplished. Perfect. Never cursed. But then becomes cursed by taking on himself our punishment that we deserve by himself dying on the cross and receiving all of the wrath of God poured out on him in place of otherwise being poured out on us. That's the good news. That is the, the promise and the confidence and the hope of the reality that you who are cursed are now no longer cursed because of Christ who became a curse for you. 
I mean, as a Christian, that's a point in which you're like, you're in the middle of a gospel conversation, you're like, just give me a second, I need a minute here. I'm just, I just got to go to the Lord and just say, praise be to God. I mean, this is why Paul himself and many of his writings just launches off in these like moments of reflection like we saw in 1 Timothy where he's like, can you believe I've been called? I've been saved. It's amazing. Praise be to God. Okay, anyway, where was I? I mean, there ought to kind of be that moment where you kind of get enthralled by the reality of the testimony, not of yourself, that one you know, but the testimony of Jesus Christ for you. That you're amazed by that. That's a point of even consideration now. When was the last time you were amazed by how committed God was to your salvation that it would even take the death of the Son of God on a cross to be cursed for you? I mean, just thanking God for your salvation. An opportunity you'll have this morning even as we come around the Lord's table and celebrate that together. What's the fourth aspect here? Well, number one, mankind's goal is to be made right with God. Number two, everyone who relies on their works will be cursed. Number three, Jesus Christ becomes cursed through his death on the cross. And kind of backing up into the text, look at what it says there. Life and peace with God is only possible through faith alone in Jesus alone. Look at at the text. The righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Go back, if you will, to chapter 3 earlier, as it says this in verse 2. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Again, in the end of chapter chapter 3, verse 5, asking the question, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? To illustrate this, verse 6, just as Abraham believed God, he had faith in God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Life and peace with God is only possible through faith. And always and forevermore through faith. I remember the first time when I was 15 years old, I heard the gospel. I had never understood, no one had explained to me this. I understood the first couple points about the gospel. I understood uh, that mankind had to be right with God. I understood anyone who relied on their works was going to be cursed. I was in trouble in my neighborhood. I was in trouble at home. I was a fighter. I was, I was a problem child. Good on the outside because of kind of southern uh, morality, but, but, but warring on the inside, and then even behind my parents' back getting into trouble. Remember the youth pastor who had moved in next door to us, James Walker, who I am forever thankful for to this day, pastors in North Carolina today, sat down with me and explained to me at my dining room table this. This being that Jesus Christ lived like I've never lived, took on himself the wrath of God, and then resurrected from the grave three days later as a demonstration that that payment was accepted by God the Father. And that if I would repent of my sins and put my faith in him, all my sins would be forgiven. And I kid you not. I thought, no way. There's no way. <laughs> You're not aware of my sin. You don't know what I've done. There might be some of you who think that, right, that way right now. This, this is a Bible talk for good Christian kids. Eric, you don't, you don't know where I've come from. You've not seen the things I've seen. You've not done the things I've done. You've not said the things I've said. Trust me, there are exceptions to this clause. And I'm one of those. It's not the case. It's not the case. It is true, unbelievably but nevertheless true, it is true that all sins... All condemnation is taken away. All of the consequences that comes from sin, all of that is removed from you by you repenting of your sins and putting your faith in Christ. Seeing yourself for who you are, no longer being in denial, and giving your life to Christ. If you've made that decision then that's your testimony 
And amazing as it is, as unbelievable as it is, it is your testimony. If it's not your story, it can be. And if there's somebody here who is thinking that there's no way it's true, friend, it is true, not because I said it, but because the Bible declares it, because Jesus spoke it himself. I wonder how many of you have been in conversations with friends, you know, at dinner parties, work events, get-togethers. And you get these storytellers, they get involved in storytelling. And one story introduces another story, which reminds them of another story, and they're like just on and on, like these endless stories, and you're like, where are we in this conversation? Right? Or they're in that one story, but they give so much detail to the story, you're like, do I really need to know all this? And if you've been in those moments, perhaps you've even been the person who's doing that in the moment. I'm sure I have. I'm sure I have at times. You know what's happening. It's kind of like that, that TMI moment, right? Too much information. I confess, my wife, I sometimes have been in this conversation, and be like, too much information, too much. Boil it down. Bring it down. What's the point? Where are we at right now? We kind of lost our way here. When you're in conversation as a Christian with other people, friends, there's so much you could say. There are so many amazing stories from the scriptures to recount. There's so much biographical information of yourself to illustrate that that you could relay. Friends, let me just encourage you with texts like Galatians 3 and others to, to distill the truth to bring it down into an understandable way that can then later be explained and studied as you read the Scriptures together and sort of unpack it. Here it is again. Here it is again. It's sort of a, a decoder ring, if you will, to understand what's taking place before you so that they might better understand it. Now, as we think about having clearly distilled what the Gospel is and how we communicate that, seeing that even in the Scripture here before us, we need to sort of weight this with the counter-arguments, because I think at times, back to the concern in Galatians, with the Galatians is a problem that still can be true today, and that is the distortion of the gospel. How can the gospel be distorted today? Well, let me, let me just give you some brief examples of what the gospel is not, so that when you are communicating, you are not confusing the message of the good news of Jesus Christ with these seemingly other lessons that are either inaccurate or are accurate but are not true as to the full representation. First of all, the gospel is not learning to love yourself. A lot of people believe today that the biggest problem with people is that they have a lack of self-esteem and need to learn like to live, just, just hug themselves a lot, just kind of walk around life, just kind of, you know, shout out to yourself. You're somebody special. Look in the mirror. I mean, this is popular in the 80s and 90s. It's sort of the self-esteem society. And the problem is these sort of these people become parents and they raise kids accordingly and they got like a bunch of self-centered offspring as if it wasn't bad enough already. The world's sort of revolving around them. The problem is only one world. The gospel is not learning to love yourself. Self-esteem means that I esteem myself and think of myself highly. You begin to pervert and distort the gospel. It's like God is like, man, you're so awesome. I'd, learn, I'd love to have you on my team. And after all, you're special. You need to know that. It's a distortion of what is true. What is true is that you are sinful. It is true that you're made in the image of God, and that gives you uniqueness and significance and dignity in your identity. That is true. But it is also true that you are corrupt in your personhood through the effect of sin. Second thing that the gospel is not, the gospel is not simply that God is love. God is certainly a God of love, but God is also a lot more than those things, as we've already spoken of this morning. He is holy and sovereign and just and righteous and graceful and merciful and kind and patient and forbearing. He is more than just one attribute of our own choosing. Third, the gospel is not simply that Jesus wants to be your friend. This comes out, unfortunately, a lot of times in children's ministry curriculum. There's a little Jesus. He's looking for a friend. Would you play with him? Oh, yeah, I feel bad for Jesus. All the same, poor guy. He needs a friend. We're BFFs now. And E, if you give your faith to him. Yet the reality is that it is true that God adopts sinful people as his sons and daughters. It is true that Jesus calls his followers brothers. It is true that whoever does the will of God is the will of the Father is considered by Jesus as family. But the gospel is so much more than this simplistic, naive reduction that's often represented. 
The gospel involves holiness and sin and payment of a ransom and the conferring of an acquittal, the winning of a war, ultimately the spreading of God's glory and His fame to all the nations. Another thing the gospel is not, the gospel is not simply that Jesus is my example. This is what theological liberalism proposes. You know, Jesus, he's a good guy. He loved people. We should love people like him. He's a religious reformer. We should reform our religions today. They're often old-fashioned, traditional. The gospel is not something that we add to our lives that will make our lives good. Unfortunately, I think this is kind of the suburbanite Christian gospel. You know what? Your kids are in sports. You finally got a down payment on a home. You landed a job with 401k benefits. You found a store that has reasonable prices. Local YM. That's what you're missing. If you get Jesus, all that gets complete and, and gets that portfolio gets fully rounded up. Friends, that's not true at all. Jesus is a jealous God. He wants all of you. He's not asking for part of you. He wants everything, and he is wanting more than just be an example. He is saying, you need a Savior, and he will be that for you if you give your life to him. It's a significant reminder for us. If we go back in Galatians chapter 2, look at it again in verse 16. Galatians 2, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Just yesterday morning, the elders and I got together on Saturday morning at 6 o'clock in the morning here as we do on a monthly basis on Saturday mornings, just kind of continuing training and refinement and thinking through theology and ministry and how to care for you and lead you and teach you accurately and make sure we're growing ourselves as men of the word. And yesterday morning, we read an article, a long article about evangelism and how to communicate the gospel. And just talk about, in that article, just a summary of the gospel message and how would you outline it, how would you explain it to people, what would you say in kind of in a, in a Bible summary fashion as what the scriptures teach. Here's an example of that gospel presentation that we read. First of all, in talking to people, we want to explain why we are here The one God is a community, a trinity of three persons who each perfectly know and defer to one another and love one another and therefore have infinite joy, glory, and peace, and perfect fellowship. And yet, God, in His wisdom, out of His grace, decided to make a beautiful world and created us in His image that we might know Him, love Him, and serve Him. That's why we're here. But secondly, what went wrong? We chose to center our lives on ourselves in the pursuit of things rather than on God, rather than on others. What has this led to? The disintegration of society and the incompleteness of our own lives. We, as a result, know war, hunger, poverty, injustice, racism, bitterness, meaninglessness, despair, sickness, and death. All these are symptoms and demonstrations of what's wrong. Sin. Sin is what's wrong. And each of us are personally responsible for it. Well, what will make this right? What puts the world right? Through God, we have a solution. Why? Because He entered history in the person of His Son, Jesus of Nazareth, in order to deal with all the causes and results of our broken relationship with Him. It is by His sacrificial life and death that He exemplifies the life we must live, and He rescues us from the life we once lived. It is by his resurrection that he proved who he was and he showed us the future. New bodies, completely renewed, completely restored heavens and earth, and the world is restored back to justice and peace and joy and the glory of God untainted by sin. How can we then be a part of putting the world right? Well, between his first coming to win us and his last coming back to save us and restore us, We live by faith in Him. We rely not on our own record, but on His record of good works. Not on our own righteousness, but on His righteousness. And He gives us a radically new identity for having believed in Him and followed Him by faith alone. He frees us with this new identity from self-righteousness and self-condemnation. 
That's an example amongst many ways. Here's the question that you have to answer for yourself if you're a Christian. What are you telling people with the gospel? Are you telling people the gospel? And if so, what are you telling them? And how are you living in a way that illustrates that very message? Now let me be clear, in the interest of full disclosure, this isn't something as simple as learning a four-part conversation, delivering it, and everybody who hears it's like, for real? Me? Yes, right now. No. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. That's why we pray the way we pray. God, open their eyes. Give them hearing. Give them ability to understand who they are and who you are, that they might believe. Without you, it's impossible, but with you, it's possible, God. So God, as I speak, may they hear, and in the hearing, may they believe. God, please do this work. And so we proclaim the gospel and we pray for God to bless that proclamation that people would believe. I asked you last week to identify some people and begin praying for them. I'm, ha- I'm back a week later to say, having now identified those people and having started praying for them, I'm asking you to now start to begin to plan to pursue them out of love and out of true, genuine compassion to pursue them with this kind of conversation in mind. That you might proclaim that gospel message, not telling them everything the Bible says, but telling them the most important thing, the central truth of the scriptures, that they, like you, might hear and believe. For some of the resources that could be helpful to you in the back lobby in the Welcome Center, there are at the table there for you available resources that can help you give out and talk to with people and think through together even as you reflect on this truth yourself. And maybe even for you today, this is a conversation you need to have. And if so, the elders, the leaders of the church would be glad to have it with you about your own relationship with the Lord. We're up front the steps and the back in the lobby area. We transition now to our time of worship, which is appropriate, our time of uh, worship around the Lord's table, which is appropriate in light of this gospel message. I'm going to pray for us that Nathan's going to come and lead us through this message as we think about what it means to have Jesus Christ, God's Son, broken for us. That in his sacrificial death that we might find forgiveness and be reminded of this, not only of our faith in him, but also collectively our identity as a people of God in him. Let's pray. This has been a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. For more information about our church or our senior pastor, Eric Bancroft, please click on the link below or visit castleview.org.